Madam President, I, before I speak on the topic that I came to speak about on the floor, which is the resolution currently before the Senate, I, I wanted to just echo the comments I already made about Senator Heller. I've enjoyed our time working together. I spent six years of my childhood in Las Vegas growing up, and so we have a lot of friends. He knows a lot of people I grew up with and are part of our family. And he'll be sorely missed here, but I'm sure warmly welcomed back home uh, to a community and to a family. And uh, we all look forward to seeing what future endeavors lie ahead for him. I think he still has much to offer our nation and, and the state of Nevada. And um, it's been an honor serving with him. Um, and, and one of the things that makes service in the Senate meaningful is when we get to discuss big issues of great importance. And um, I want to start by thanking the authors of this uh, War Powers Resolution on Yemen. Because while I may not agree with them, and I'm going to describe why in a moment, I think it's important that the Senate have big debates about big topics and play its rightful role. The, the Senate and the legislative branch have an important role to play in setting the foreign policy of the United States. I actually don't think the War Powers Act is even constitutional. I believe it is an unconstitutional restraint on the power of the Commander in Chief. And even if it were constitutional, I do not believe that our engagement or what we are doing in Yemen with the Saudi UAE coalition rises to the level of triggering it. That doesn't mean that Congress should not be involved. And frankly, the one way you could be involved is if you wanted to, and you wanted to pronounce yourself on a matter of this topic, uh, you should file to cut off the money. I wouldn't support it, but that's where Congress's power really comes from. Shut off the money, say no money can be spent on this effort. Uh, few people uh, are willing to do that, and so we rely on these other mechanisms uh, which exist in our law. But I want to talk more about the why I think it's a bad idea to vote for this and why I hope more of my colleagues will join me in opposing it. First of all, I understand what's happening. This, this resolution is not new. It's been discussed before. It existed for a number of months, well before Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi's brutal murder at the Saudi consulate in Yemen. So this is not a new issue, but it has become, for many members, sort of a, a proxy, a, a, a vehicle by which they can ex express displeasure at the way the administration and the president have responded to the murder of Mr. Khashoggi. Now, I want to tell you, I think what's happened to Mr. Khashoggi is an outrage. I don't need a smoking gun. I don't need intelligence briefings to tell me that the crown prince is responsible. If you know anything about Saudi Arabia, if you know anything about how their government works, and if you know anything about the crown prince, you know that there's no way that 17 guys close to him get on an airplane, fly to a third country, chop a guy up in a consulate, dispose of the body, and fly back, and he didn't know anything about it. It's just not real. It's also consistent with the pattern of behavior by the crown prince. I mean, he literally kidnapped the prime minister of Lebanon about a year and a half ago. He's jailed multiple members of his family and government because they weren't in support of him being the successor to the king. And um, so this is a pattern of behavior that needs to be dealt with. I do not believe dealing with it requires us to shatter the Saudi-U.S. Alliance. Foreign policy is hard because it must be infused by our values and a defense of human rights. And I say this with humility. I hold my record up to that of anyone in this chamber when it comes to fighting on behalf of human rights and humanitarian causes. And we have a lot of great champions of that in the U.S. Senate. But we also have to recognize that that has to be balanced sometimes with realism. And it requires us to make difficult decisions. The interesting thing about foreign policy is often it is not a choice between a great idea and a bad idea. It's often a choice between two less than ideal outcomes, and you're trying to figure out which one would do the least harm and make the most sense. And in many ways, what we are facing here in this debate about the Saudi-U.S. alliance is that I have long recognized and condemned the horrifying human rights violations that occur at a systemic level in Saudi Arabia, and I will continue to do so. But I also recognize that a, there is a threat in the Middle East posed by Iran and their ambitions, which must be confronted. And it must be confronted now regionally, or eventually it will pull the United States in into direct conflict. And Saudi Arabia and our coalition is a key part, Saudi Arabia and our alliance is a key part of that coalition. So it would be a mistake to shatter it. In the case of Yemen, this has become a proxy issue for the broader issue of the murder of Mr. Khashoggi. And I know that hopefully later today there will be a resolution offered by the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee and the majority leader. I hope others will join in it. It makes very clear that the vast majority of members in this chamber condemn 
what happened to Mr. Khashoggi and hold the Crown Prince responsible for his murder. There's no disputing that what's happening in Yemen is a horrifying humanitarian tragedy. The numbers speak for themselves. 50, over 57,000 human beings have lost their lives. There are about half the country's population, roughly of 28 million people, are starving to death, including many women and children. 2.3 million people have been displaced from their homes. It's horrifying. And there is plenty of blame to go around, including Iran and their Houthi surrogates. The first question I would ask is, if this resolution passes and were to become law, would it end this conflict? If we passed this and the White House were somehow forced to do what we're asking them to do, it wouldn't end this conflict. This conflict will continue. This fight will continue. And the reason why is pretty straightforward. The Saudis view the Houthis as agents of Iran. They already see agents of Iran via Hezbollah in Syria, in Iraq, obviously for a long time in Lebanon, and now to their west and south, Yemen. And they're not just agents of Iran. They have launched rockets ballistic missiles into Saudi Arabia after civilian populations, including efforts to kill members of the Saudi royal family and government leadership. They have threatened global shipping in the region where over 400 million barrels of oil a day transit, critical to the world's energy supplies. So they're going to have a war. There is no way Saudi Arabia or the UAE or any of these countries are going to allow themselves to be encircled by Iranian agents. This conflict will continue irrespective of what we do. And the Saudis will have no problem buying weapons. One of the sad facts about the world today is countries have plenty of sources from which they can buy this weaponry and plenty of countries and arms dealers that are willing to sell it to you. Will this resolution, if it passes, end the suffering? The answer, sadly, is no. It will not. In fact, it is the Houthis that have blocked the two access roads that lead to the port, making it difficult to deliver aid. It is the Houthis who have placed mines at the entrance of the port. It is the Houthis, by the way, who are torturing people torturing people. We've seen reports of faces being smashed by batons, of people being hung, hanging from chains by their genitals and by their wrists for weeks in places, people being scorched with acid. That's the Houthis. That will continue. Will this end the warfare? It will not. It will not end the warfare. In fact, I think it has the potential to trigger broader warfare. First of all, I won't end the warfare because right now they're having peace talks. Put yourself in common sense for a moment and ask yourself, if you're the Houthis and you just read in the newspaper that now the U.S. Senate has voted to end support for Saudi Arabia, you know what they're thinking? We don't need a peace deal. We might be able to win this thing now. They don't know that it's not going to become law, that the House is not going to take it up. They don't know any of that. They just read that the U.S. is weakening in its support of Saudi Arabia and they think we don't need a peace deal. It's going to embolden them to not strike a peace deal. But here's where I think it really gets dangerous. The U.S. stops its support of Saudi Arabia. Houthis establish more control and more stability in their control in areas of Yemen. What are they going to do then? Are they then going to go rebuild the country and build roads and bridges and move on to an era of prosperity and peace? They are not. They are going to become what they are, but in an expanded way, agents of Iranian influence and of Iranian-sponsored violence. Here's what you can expect to see if the Houthis establish control of key areas of Yemen and are able to, to sort of reach a stalemate or worse, are able to solidify their grip on power. You are going to see hundreds of ballistic missiles launched against Saudi Arabia, missiles that, by the way, in a contingency where there's a crisis between the U.S. and Iran, would also be able to target American servicemen and women serving in the region. You're going to see these explosive UAVs that they've already used attacking into Saudi Arabia. And you know what Saudi Arabia is going to do in response? They're going to hit them back even harder. In fact, they may even hit Iran, triggering an even broader war. And it gets worse. It gets worse because you can also see them using explosive boats and anti-ship missiles to cut off shipping lanes in the Arabian Gulf. At that point, you will see the United States Navy be called upon to go in there and reopen shipping because the global energy supply is relying upon it and the world looks to the U.S. as the guarantor of the freedom of the seas. And so, in essence, this could very well lead in the long run to an even broader and more dangerous conflict that could involve us, that could pull us in. That's the way we need to think about these issues. Not just what's before us now. You've got to think two or three steps ahead. 
And two or three steps ahead is this could become a broader conflict that forces us in. And imagine if for a moment we know for a fact that Iran's plans are to use surrogates to attack the U.S. in instances of a crisis. That's why there's the, the Shia militias in Iraq are so dangerous. At a moment's notice, they could decide we're going to start attacking American troops in Iraq. And Iran's going to say it wasn't us, it was the Shia militia. That's why Hezbollah in Syria is so dangerous. And that's why Hezbollah, Lebanese Hezbollah is so dangerous. That's why they have cells all over the world all ready to be activated at a moment of crisis as an asymmetrical way for Iran to attack the United States without direct attribution. And now we're going to give them one more, the Houthis in Yemen, to target our servicemen and women and our allies in the region. And then we will have to respond. And then you will be in a war involving American servicemen and women. Now, nothing that we are doing now guarantees that that won't happen anyway. But I'm telling you that if we pull out of this effort, if we pull out of this effort, it makes it likelier, I think it makes it likely that we will see a broader conflict in the very near future that will involve the United States of America directly. And on this final point, I would just say that it is important for us to think about these things pragmatically because we lose our influence over the conduct of this war. The Saudi authorities do not do a good job, their military, of respecting the rules of war. In fact, they have a military culture in Saudi Arabia where you are, you're likelier to get punished for not taking the shot than for blowing up a bus full of children or hitting a residential project. You are likelier to be punished for not taking the shot than for taking a shot that kills innocents. That has to change. And we have some level of influence now, given our, the fact that we're engaged with them, to sort of steer them in that direction and explain to them what trouble our alliance is here in Washington. We lose that influence if we walk away. So I do sympathize with the two points behind this resolution, reasserting congressional authority on foreign policy. I agree we need to have more oversight and engagement. And I agree that the conduct of this war in Yemen is horrifying and what's happening to civilians there is terrible. I just don't think us pulling out makes it better. I actually think it makes it worse. And I actually think in the long run, it sucks America into a much broader and more dangerous conflict. And that's why I hope more of these senators here today will oppose this resolution. We do need to send a clear message to Saudi Arabia that what the Crown Prince did to Mr. Khashoggi is unacceptable. But this is the wrong way to do the right thing. I yield the floor.